Hi, my name is Beth Glenn. Welcome to today's Pump Systems webinar. All of PGE's trainings are sponsored by Energy Trust of Oregon. We work together to make sure the concepts and recommendations you learn are consistent across all of our individual programs and services. Before we get started with this training, let's find out who's joined us today. Please use one of your tools located on the left side of your screen to let us know what type of facility you represent. This will help me point out parts of my presentation with, which might apply to each of you. If you don't see your facility type listed, enter it in the chat window located to the right of your screen. Beth, in terms of the other comment that people are commenting in chat, we have um, a hospital, an energy efficiency company, and um, a PGE employee. Okay, great. Oh, and a high-rise residential. Okay. Okay, so I think we can move on to start with today's agenda. Um, so we'll start with some of the basics on centrifugal pumps, and then we will cover the top 10 energy efficiency opportunities, and then we will move on to how to spot opportunities at your facility, and then we'll go through some case studies where facilities implemented some of the opportunities and received incentives from Energy Trust. Then we will follow up with Greg Nelson to hear about resources available to you. Okay. so. This slide is to show the key components of a centrifugal pump. Uh, there are other types of pumps, for example, positive displace displacement pumps, but this discussion will focus on centrifugal pumps. Some of the same opportunities will apply, but centrifugal pumps will have some additional energy efficiency opportunities. So as you can see, the fluid is pulled in from the suction side of the pump, is pressurized by the impeller, and then exits at the discharge of the pump. One key thing to note here is that we'll talk about a potential energy efficiency measure to trim the impeller of the pump. And in this cutout, you can see the impeller, and there's this arrow pointing to it, and reducing the impeller diameter would reduce the capacity of the pump, but would also result in energy savings. So we'll talk about that a little bit in some of the case studies. Okay, so some of us may already be familiar with this equation. For those of us who may not be, there's no need to memorize this. It's provided as a way to help us get a better idea of where the energy savings come from in a pumping system. So we can see that pump power is a function of the flow, head, and hydraulic efficiency. And this is important because this tells us that we can get savings from doing three things. So the BHP in that equation is the brake horsepower, so the power that that pump is, is operating at. The SG in that equation is just specific gravity, so a lot of times we might be pumping water, so for water, the specific gravity is just one. The Q is the flow, and that's in gallons per minute, and that's just a measure of how much fluid we're pumping. So if we decrease the pump flow, we'll decrease the power. So in this case, if we just simply use less water, we'll use less power. H is pump head, and that's just a measure of the pressure that the pump delivers. If we decrease the pump head that we're operating at, we'll decrease the power. So one example of that could be if we were using a variable frequency drive to slow down the pump to operate at a lower head at the same flow. And then uh, on the bottom, there's eta, and that's the hydraulic efficiency, and that's just a measure of the pump's performance. And because the hydraulic efficiency is in the denominator of the equation, if we increase the hydraulic efficiency of the pump, we'll use less power. And so this could be accomplished by choosing a new pump that operates at a higher hydraulic efficiency at the normal operating conditions. And then lastly, the energy that a pump uses is the pump power multiplied it by the hours that the pump is running. So if we decrease the run hours of the pump, we'll decrease the energy consumption of the pump. So those four key things are how we can save energy in a pumping system. Okay, so we'll move on to pump curves. 
So the key takeaway from the slide is really just that each pump has a unique curve from the manufacturer which specifies the rated pump head, hydraulic efficiency, and pump power at a given flow rate. We won't dive into the curves much further, further than this. Uh, we can point out a couple of things that each pump will have a unique curve based on the speed that it's operating at. So in this case, this pump, it, this impeller, or this pump curve is rated for a speed of 1,780 RPM. And we can see that there are different curves for different impeller diameters. So we'll look at the 10 inch. There's another curve for 11 inch impeller. 12 inch all the way up to 14 inch impeller for this particular pump curve. So the pump curves help us calculate the energy savings for various energy efficiency opportunities. Okay, so we're going to move on to the top 10 energy efficiency opportunities section. We're going to review the top 10 energy savings opportunities that you can consider at your facility. We'll want to keep these in mind throughout the presentation because as we cover the case studies, we will ask you to participate by identifying which opportunities apply to each case study. So the first one that we'll talk about is minimize loads. We want to reduce the demand on the system, which in our case means reduce gallons of water. So we can save energy by decreasing the flow. Number two. Use your best part load option. Most equipment is pretty efficient when it's operated at 100% capacity, but its efficiency can drop off radically when we only need 50% capacity or 10% capacity. We will see one example of a site that had a pump that was operating at a flow that was only 20% of the flow that it was designed for. So sometimes there are options to control a piece of equipment so when it's running at low capacity, the efficiency is still good. In the case of centrifugal pumps, VFDs can add significant savings. Number three, turn it off. So let's get idle equipment shut down and isolated. And this would be an example of decreasing the run hours of the equipment. Number four, minimize pressure drops. Sometimes a bad actor will have a high pressure drop which forces us to operate at a higher pressure in order to compensate. So this could be a plugged filter, undersized piping. In this case, we would, looking, be, we would be looking at ways to decrease the pump head. Number five, optimize pressure settings. In general, we need enough water pressure to do the job, but excess pressure can increase pump power. The savings in this case would be coming from decreasing the pump head. Number six, Keep idling time to a minimum. This is related to item number three, but there may be a potential to set up automatic controls to shut off pumps when not needed and to restart automatically when they are needed. This would be another example of decreasing the run hours. Number seven, right technology. From time to time, we'll see someone using the wrong technology for the job. This can cause the system to be fundamentally inefficient and use more power than necessary. Number eight, right-sized equipment. Undersized equipment won't get the job done, but occasionally we find systems that are much larger than needed. This could be due to a change in the production or if the system was just over-designed from the start. And this can force equipment to operate at a low capacity where the efficiency might be terrible. There could be savings from increased efficiency, decreasing the flow, or decreasing the head in this case. Number nine, Remove barriers to efficient set points. One example could be, do we really need as much flow as we think we need for a process or as high of a pressure? If there's an opportunity to reduce this, there could be savings. And lastly, number 10, make the most of your controls. Sometimes systems could have controls in place already to start or stop equipment, but they aren't being used. If the controls aren't already in place, sometimes installing controls is a cheap and economical way to save energy when compared to equipment replacements. Okay, so now we will move on to how to spot opportunities at your facility. In this photo, we have a control valve at the discharge of a pump. In 
the right hand side of the screen you can see that the control valve was open 30% and it was normally throttled in that position. But occasionally the valve would be open 100%. So this can be a good candidate for a variable frequency drive opportunity. Oftentimes throttled control valves have significant pressure drops. And you'll see where this comes into play in some of the case studies. It is important to note that just because the valve is open 50% does not mean that you're getting 50% of the flow. There could be a wide variation depending on the type of valve that's installed. However, a throttled valve is usually an indicator of an opportunity. Uh, the photo on the left is an example of a control valve. So in this case, that would indicate that the flow is likely variable and that the control valve is used to vary it based on some measured operating condition. The photo on the right just shows a manual valve. And lots of times these are set at a constant position all or most of the time. This could be an indicator of a constant flow, which could be a candidate for an impeller trim or a shift change. Variable frequency drives, or variable speed drives, are devices which actually control the speed of the motor. They can be used to replace existing controls and could control the flow or pressure or consistency or whatever variable that you are measuring and controlling to. They are good for variable flow applications as you can adjust the speed to match the desired conditions. Another thing to look for would be scenarios where, where multiple pumps are operating. Do all of the pumps need to operate to provide the appropriate flow or pressure, or can we get away with fewer pumps? This can be especially important with multiple pumps of different sizes operating in parallel. There can be scenarios where one pump may not be providing flow at the operating conditions. Now we will take a look at some case study examples and to see how energy trust incentives can help cover the cost of upgrades. This first case study is an operations and maintenance project example. So this customer had a pump that was pumping from this secondary standpipe up through a manual control valve and out to some cleaners. So at the cleaners, there was a pressure of 40 pounds per square inch that was required, and that was just required by their process. And so the manual valve was throttled and held at a constant position to maintain that 40 pounds at the cleaners. So we can see that we actually logged the discharge pressure from this pump and it was operating at, it looks like close to 65 pounds discharge pressure, but really they only needed 40 pounds at the cleaners. So, uh, the discharge pressure and the required flow in this case was constant and it had a manual control valve, so it was a good application for an impeller trim in this case. So this is the pump curve for this particular project. So we can see that the pump was operating at about 2,000 gallons per minute constantly and we can see that the blue line shows the pump curve and it was operating at it had 13 inch impeller diameter for this project. And at that 2,000 gallons per minute, we saw that the log to discharge pressure from that pump was about 65 pounds when the site really only needed about 45, 40 pounds at the cleaner. So this next slide shows that the pump impeller was trimmed from 13 inches to 12.2 inches. And that resulted in, you can see the orange arrow there, uh, showing us pump head savings of roughly 20 feet from this change. So this next slide shows us the changes that were made to the system. So the manual control valve was open further because we trimmed the pump impeller so that it was operating at less capacity and so it was providing less of a pressure at the flow that we wanted. So we had to open that manual valve a little bit further in order to maintain that 40 pounds that was required at the cleaners. 
and so that manual valve was still used to throttle to the appropriate pressure. So for this particular project, the total project cost was about $11,000. The baseline energy cost to operate the pump was about $39,500 per year. The energy cost to operate that pump after the impeller trim was about $33,000 per year, which gave us energy savings of about $6,500 per year. The incentives for this project were 50% of the project cost at $5,500, which resulted in a project payback of 0.8 years after incentives, so a pretty quick payback for this particular project. Now it's your turn to participate and identify which opportunities this case study showcase. Check all that apply, and remember that your tools are located in the left corner of your screen. And if you have any questions about how to use your tools, please chat with Beth in the chat window. Okay, it looks like we've got a lot of really good responses, and I really think a lot of these opportunities could apply, but the ones that I had identified as fitting the most closely to this study were this number four, to minimize pressure drops. So we were able to reduce the pressure drop across the manual valve. This number five, to optimize pressure settings. So the site had a pressure requirement of 40 pounds at the cleaners, and so we were able to trim the pump impeller to more closely match that pressure that was required. And number eight, the right size equipment. So we adjusted the impeller size to reduce the capacity of the pump. Okay, so we'll move on to the next case study here. Thanks for your participation in that slide. So this second case study is another operations and maintenance project example. So in this case, during normal operation, the recirculation valve was open and the valve to the clarifier was closed. So they were actually just pumping from the pump through this recirculation valve and back into the pit where it came from. So they were just pumping in a circle normally. And then occasionally when the level in that sludge pit got high, the recirculation valve would close and the valve to the clarifier would open and they would pump into the clarifier to reduce the level in the sludge pit. So during normal operation, they were just pumping around in a circle and conversations with site personnel indicated that that recirculation loop was not required for the process. There are some times when uh, we found that there is a requirement in the process to recirculate some of the flow, but in this case, it, it wasn't required by the site. So the customer decided to add relays to cycle the pump to control the level in the sludge pit using the existing float level devices. Instead of the level transmitter controlling the valves, it was used to cycle the pump. And so the recirculation valve was just forced closed in the field and the valve to the clarifier was forced open in the field. So the pump was just cycled uh, when, when the level got high in order to uh, move some of the level into this clarifier. Beth, I'm sorry, I have a question from the audience. Can you clarify what a sludge pit is? Yeah, so in this case, that was just, it was a customer uh, specific, so that, that would be a customer specific term, but it was just a uh, tank of water. 
is all it was. So they were pumping from one tank of water to the clarifier. Okay, so for this project, the total project cost for adding the controls was $4,000. The baseline energy cost to run the pump was $14,000 per year. The new level controls resulted in the pump only operating 30% of the time. So 70% of the time that pump was just pumping right back into the tank where it came from. The energy cost after the controls were added was $5,000 per year which resulted in energy savings of $9,000 per year. The incentives for this project were 50% of the project cost at $2,000, which resulted in a very quick payback for this project at 0.2 years after incentives. So this was a pretty, pretty good project for this particular customer. Okay, so it's time to participate again. So let's check which opportunities were identified in this case study. Okay, so again, it looks like we've got a lot of really good responses to this question. Um, the opportunities that I felt best fit this case study were uh, this number one, to minimize loads. So we reduce the flow from the pump because most of the time that pump was just running to pump water in a circle. Uh, it looks like most of us got this one, uh, number three, turn it off. So we turn off the pump when we didn't need it. Uh, and that really does go with this, this other one to keep idling time to a minimum. So we, we did turn off the pump when we didn't need it. Uh, next one would be remove barriers to more efficient set points. So it turned out that they actually really didn't need the recirculation flow as part of the process. So once this was determined, we were able to, weigh the, we were able to change the way that the pump was controlled. And then lastly, uh, make the most of your controls. So we were able to use the existing level controls to cycle the pump instead of the control valve. So a lot of really good answers to this particular one. So we can move on to the third case study. And this is an example of a capital project. So in this case, this was um, a 30 horsepower pump, which was used to control the level in the seal pit. And just to clarify, the seal pit um, in this case was just a, a tank. Uh, there's, there was water in here, and they were uh, controlling to the level in this seal pit. So they were pumping from the seal pit, through the pump, through the control valve, and out to the process. So this control valve, was heavily throttled, so it was open about 20% on average. But occasionally, that control valve was 100% open. So they do need the full flow at times. So in this case, we looked at installing a VFD and not trimming the impeller so that they're able to operate at the full flow and capacity when they need it. So in this case, we can see that we logged the level control valve position. And so normally it was 20% open, but occasionally there were times when it got up to 100% open. So they do need the full flow and pressure from the pump sometimes. So again, this makes it a good candidate for a VFD so that they're able to run at 100% speed when they need that full flow and pressure. So in this case, this was the pump curve for this particular project. So we can see that when the control valve was throttled, so at that 20% position, they were operating at a flow of about 400 gallons per minute. 
but occasionally when that control valve was open 100%, they were operating at closer to 800 gallons per minute. So this next slide shows us that the customer decided to install a VFD so that control valve was forced open 100% so that the VFD speed could be used to control the flow. So this blue line was still what that pump curve looked like at 100% speed. The analysis showed that at their normal operating condition, conditions to achieve the pressure that they needed at that 400 gallons per minute flow rate, the pump could operate at 50% speed. So occasionally when they needed full flow, the, the pump would operate at that 100% speed curve, and most of the times the pump would operate at 50% speed. So you can see in orange the large pump head savings from operating at 50% speed most of the time. And that savings was previously seen as a pressure drop across that control valve. Okay, so this slide shows the changes that were made in that system. So previously, the control valve was utilized to control the level in the seal pit. When it would get high, it would open more so that it could pump out. But the VFD was added to slow down the pump to control the level, and then the control valve was just forced open 100% in the field. So the energy savings from this particular pump case study, the total project cost for the VFD was $23,000. The baseline energy cost to run that pump was about $7,500 per year. The energy cost after the VFD was installed was only $1,000 per year, which resulted in energy savings of about $6,500 per year for this particular pump. The incentives, again, were 50% of the project cost at $11,500, which resulted in a project payback of about 1.8 years after incentives. So still a pretty quick payback, but again, a little bit more of an expensive project with the VFD added. Okay, so we have another participation opportunity. So again, let's mark off which of these opportunities applied to this case study. I'll give everyone just another couple seconds to answer this one. Okay, so it looks like we've got a, a lot of uh, good responses to this one. So the opportunities that I thought were showcased in this case study were Number two, use your best part load option. So in this case, uh, I think we really installed a new method of part load operation with the VFD. This number four, minimize pressure drops. So we eliminated a large pressure drop across the control valve. And I, this next one, uh, right technology. So we actually installed a VFD which was the appropriate technology for this particular application. And then it looks like a lot of you had this one, the make the most of your controls. And I think that's a good one also because we were able to use the VFD with the existing level controls and that resulted in a lot of pump pressure savings. Okay, so we will move on to our last case study which is another capital project. So in this case, the customer was pumping from a storage tank, and again, this was uh, just water, um, but in this case, the specific gravity of this particular water was 0.941, it wasn't one, um, because of the pressure and temperature that we were operating at. So the 
pump was pumping from that storage tank through a control valve, which was used to control the flow of the pump, and then to a power boiler. And at that boiler, the customer had a 400-pound discharge pressure that was required. So in this particular uh, case study, the flow had been significantly reduced from the design flow. So their production was very different than how uh, the, the system was designed for. And so the customer was interested in looking at a new pump and a VFD, and we'll see why in the next couple of slides. So this shows us the pump curve for the pump that was existing when we got there. The blue line shows us the pump curve for the impeller uh, for this particular project. And the design condition was 1,000 gallons per minute. However, uh, they were actually operating at a flow of about 220 gallons per minute. So at that average flow, we can see this green line shows us the hydraulic efficiency for this particular pump. And at that flow, the average hydraulic efficiency was only 30%. So just to give some perspective uh, for a pump that was operating at the design conditions, we would want to see that hydraulic efficiency a lot higher, maybe closer to 60 to 70 or 80 percent, so, so definitely higher than what they were operating at. So the customer elected to install a, a new pump that was more properly sized, uh, closer to the operating flow rate that they were at because their, their production indicated that they were going to operate at that lower flow rate for uh, the foreseeable future. And they also elected to install a VFD because, as pumps normally are, even though the, even the new pump was a little bit over-designed for the no, normal operation. So the new pump curve at 100% speed was this blue line. And so we can see from this arrow here, the design condition uh, was a little bit higher than, than where they were actually operating at. So I think it was a little bit higher than 300 gallons per minute was what the design condition was. So, but they were actually really only operating at that 220 gallons per minute. So uh, with the VFD, they were able to slow down a, the pump during normal operation and run at only 90% speed. So the second blue line was the pump curve at 90% speed. And you can see that the orange arrow there shows us the pump head savings for operating with the VFD. The other significant savings that came from this project were from the hydraulic efficiency. So we can see that the average efficiency for this new pump that they were running was about 68%. And that's huge savings from going from 30% to 68% efficiency. So additionally, resizing the pump uh, allowed for a little bit smaller motor size. So they actually went from a 400 horsepower motor to a 150 horsepower motor. So this actually helped the project cost a little bit because they were actually able to install a less expensive VFD for this particular project. So we'll look here at this slide and see what changes were made to the system. So we can see on the left-hand side here that the pump was actually uh, taken out and replaced with a new pump and a smaller motor, and the control valve was forced open 100% in the field, and a VFD was added to control the speed of the motor to control the flow. Okay. So we will look at the energy savings from this case study. The total project cost was $180,000. And again, this is going to be our most expensive project because uh, they actually installed a new pump and a VFD and a new motor. The baseline energy cost to run that 400 horsepower pump was $82,000 per year. The energy cost after the project was about $35,000 per year, which resulted in energy savings of $47,000 per year. The incentives for this project were 50% of the project cost at $90,000. 
which resulted in a project payback of 1.9 years after incentives. So even with a relatively high project cost, the energy savings brought, and incentives brought that project payback down to less than two years, which made it a really a pretty good project. Okay, so this is our last opportunity to participate. So let's choose the opportunities that apply to this case study. Give everyone just another couple seconds to respond to this one. Okay, so we have a lot of really great responses to this one as well. So the opportunities that I identified and highlighted from this case study were this number two, to use the best part load option. So in this case, they really installed a new method of part load operation with the VFD. This number four, to minimize pressure drops. So really they eliminated a large pressure drop across the control valve, and that was a good source of energy savings. Number five, optimize pressure settings. So the customer had a particular discharge pressure that was required by the process, and they were able to maintain that. Number seven, right technology. So the customer installed a VFD, which was the, the right technology for this particular application. And then it looks like a lot of us have this one, the right size equipment. So in this case, they installed a new pump and a motor that was more properly sized for the operating conditions that they were actually operating at. Okay, so today we've covered some of the basics about centrifugal pump and their operation, the top 10 energy efficiency opportunities and how we can spot these opportunities at your facility. And then we went over four case studies where customers have applied these opportunities and were able to in obtain incentives for implementing the energy efficiency projects. Before we finish off the day, let's hear from Energy Trust representative Greg Nelson about the incentives and support available from Energy Trust. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, uh, I'm Greg Nelson. I'm a program delivery contractor for Energy Trust of Oregon's Industry and Agriculture Program. Energy Trust serves uh, customers of Portland General Electric, Pacific Power, Northwest Natural, and Cascade Natural Gas. For our industrial customers, your company will be served by one of three firms that are program delivery contractors or PDCs. The PDCs will deploy Energy Trust program in the field. Exactly who serves your business will depend on your location, but regardless of uh, the PDC that works with you, uh, we will bring our understanding of industry to identify opportunities to help save energy at your facility. We will help you take advantage of Energy Trust technical services and cash incentives and help you make upgrades to it or install equipment that saves energy and reduces your energy costs. Beth uh, provided some great examples today of, of incentive opportunities, but one of my favorites is when I get to work with a customer to relieve some pain points. Let's take, for example, uh, a pumping system that's not providing adequate flow or pressure. You could add another booster pump to the system to work with the existing equipment to provide that flow that you need. But then you're just adding another piece of equipment, another potential failure point, another maintenance item for you. I like it when I can work with a customer to maybe look for some bottlenecks in the system, maybe rework the piping, maybe replace an impeller on an existing piece of equipment to minimize the amount of equipment running but save you energy and at the same time let you take advantage of incentives. I wanted to point out that uh, while most of the examples we gave today are industrial examples. I realize some of you are commercial customers, and the trust does have a different delivery mechanism for commercial customers where they can provide similar uh, industry standards, uh, people with, with some great experience to help you with your, your, your goal. But basically what's shown here on the screen is how you can work through 
uh, your PDC to help you with uh, energy efficiency projects. And with that, I want to thank you all for your interest in saving energy at your business. If you have any questions, we will be addressing them at the end of the seminar. And now I'd like to hand it over to Beth Strasberger, your host. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Beth, Glenn. And before we proceed to the question portion of the webinar, I'd like to remind you that you can still send me your questions through chat. <coughs> Excuse me. And Beth, it looks like our first question is, I hope I'll get this right, it's kind of long. Pump efficiency standards, standards are being introduced starting in 2020. The efficiency metric is called pump energy index, which is the ratio of pump efficiency ratings for two pumps. Can you explain how this works? So I am a little bit familiar with those changes, but not overly familiar with them. So I think I'm going to have to table this question and we can uh, get back to you guys on that one. Yeah, we can, um, we'll send you a little bit more of an answer for that um, uh, after the seminar with the, with the thank you. Okay, it looks like our next question is, for Beth, is what is the most common pump opportunity that you see? So probably the two most common opportunities that I see uh, and that were included in the case studies are impeller trims and VFDs. So impeller trims are typically better suited for constant flow operation and for <laughs> options when, when you don't need the full capacity of the pump at times. So they're typically less expensive than installing VFDs. However, VFDs are a little bit lower risk to install as you're still able to use the full capacity of the pump and operate the VFD at 100% when you do actually need that full flow and pressure from the pump. Thanks, Beth. Our next question is about VFDs. What is the typical cost of a VFD? So as a rough estimate, for scoping level numbers, I usually use about $400 a horsepower for cost, and this tends to be pretty conservative in most cases. All right, that sounds good. And how do VFDs work? Sure, so they're actually used to control the speed of the motor, so they can be used to replace existing controls, and they can control the flow or pressure or consistency or whatever variable that you're measuring and want to control to. And so they're typically good for variable flow applications as you can adjust the speed to match the desired operating conditions. Thanks. And a next question, how would you decide between an impeller trim project or upgrading to a VFD? Sure, so if it is a constant flow application and the site never needs the full flow and pressure from the pump, then that can be a good application for an impeller trim. But for variable flow applications, you would likely want to go with the VFD. Okay, so this is, uh, looks like our last question. If anybody has any more questions for Beth or for Greg about uh, energy trust incentives or services, um, please chat with me. So Beth, what is a common source of pressure drops in a pumping system? Control valves are a very common source of pressure drops in pumping systems, as we have seen from kind of some of the case studies. And also, Greg had mentioned uh, that there can be some piping restrictions, which may also be another uh, pretty common source of pressure drops. Thanks, Beth. And uh, I want to thank all of you. That was our last question.